It started? Yeah. Do I have to wear my mask? No. I don't. All right, should I just start? Yeah, you're live streaming. I'm live streaming? Okay. Uh, who do I look at? Bye, guys. Thank you for that, Nick. Uh, all right, name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Um, today we're going to talk about uh, the third part in our liturgy series, uh, the liturgy and theology. So the first two parts, um, well, first let me uh, read this nice quote. Um, it is needful to understand the miracle of the mysteries, what it is, why it was given, and what is its profit. Oh, and... Um, and uh, this, this quote by St. John Chrysostom, I think, uh, embodies sort of why we're studying the liturgy and how we can uh, follow the liturgy uh, with our mind, our body, and our spirit all together. Um, this is our schedule so far. So we've done the first two parts, the institution of liturgy and the historical and comparative analysis. And today we're going to talk about uh, liturgy and theology. So what exactly is the liturgy, um, what it means, uh, and, 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 and how it's significant in our, in our lives. You know, first thing is why study the liturgy, and this is always an important question. Um, the first thing is it allows me to participate fully uh, with my whole being. So, uh, you know, I could just, um, uh, I could just, uh, you know, attend the liturgy and stand there and take the blessing of the liturgy. But when I understand something, I can pray the liturgy, I can comprehend it, and I can be more engaged in the liturgy. So, all of these things require uh, me some understanding, some learning, some reading, uh, some time to get to um, that point. Um, if you want to close the door, Nagy, that would be All right, today's talk conveys a very, very important point. Uh, and the point is that the partaking of the Eucharist isn't just important, um, it's everything. And this is, uh, you know, the, you know the, way, the way I like to, to think about the, the Eucharist is it isn't just important, it's everything that, that needs to happen. Uh, it's everything in our lives. Um, okay. So quickly, I want to uh, remind you of this word anamnesis. When we say do this in remembrance of me, we talked about this last time, but I'll just kind of review it. Um, the idea is that the word amnesia, uh, anamnesis is the remembrance of me, and that, that's the Greek word for remembrance. And the word amnesia is the same root. Uh, amnesia means to forget both the past and the present. And amnesia, or not amnesia in the Greek, is to remember both the past and the present. So the word am amnesis means that I'm remembering the, the, the present, not just a memory of a past event that happened. So uh, we don't think of the, the Eucharist as a remembrance or a memorial, but rather something I'm living. Um, St. John Chrysostom said that the very la that very same supper at which Christ was present is accomplished. The Eucharist supper does not differ from that supper in any way. He continued, he who celebrated the divine Eucharist at the last supper is the same one who now also performs these mysteries. So we don't even say that Abuna performed the liturgy, we say Christ performed the liturgy. And we simply uh, were, became a part of that living liturgy that's continuing, um, that never ends. So this is why, because of this word amne uh, anamnesia, uh, excuse me, anamnesis, and the, the concept of, of the importance of living inside the liturgy, um, every time there's an icon of the liturgy, uh, when you look at the icon carefully, you find that uh, when I look at where am I during the liturgy, I find that I'm actually at the table with Christ. So the, the, there is only one last supper and we simply relive and we become a part of that, this last supper over and over again. Peter, do you know how to turn off the live stream when I'm done? Alhamdulillah. <laughs> All right, so you can see it in every icon here um, that always we, the, the person is seated at the, we are seated as we view the icon as part of the Eucharist. So it helps us remember this idea of anamnesis and the idea that it's a living remembrance of, of, of one event, of one Eucharist that took place uh, back, in, uh, back 2,000 years ago, but it is a continually uh, alive event. Uh, very quickly, to summarize last time, we, we talked a little bit about the Middle Ages and we said that those who do not study history are doomed to repeat it. We said the Western Church made two uh, primary mistakes. The first one was they got involved in politics, uh, and the second one they w used the Latin uh, too much when more uh, uh, modern languages had come uh, into Europe, and they insisted on, on sticking to Latin. The combination of these two factors devastated their liturgical life, and we found a split between their spiritual life and the liturgical life. Um, we found that 
they were it was optional just to understand the liturgy just that we could just perform the liturgy and just go through the motions which is something unfortunately sometimes we see here in the Coptic Church that it's okay just to go through the motions um, without actually um, understanding and participating in my full being uh, it widened the gulf between the clergy and the laity and I'm going to talk about that uh, here in a second but there became an us versus them mentality. The clergy were this much higher group of people who, who understood everything and knew what was going on. The laity had no rule, role in the Eucharist. Um, and this gave birth ultimately to the Protestant movement, which uh, dismantled the clergy and said basically all of us are equal and all the people you know, uh, pray and all the people worship together. Um, and they, they removed any kind of hierarchy or structure from the church at all. Um, and one reason is a simple reaction to uh, what the Catholic Church had, had become uh, due to the destruction of the liturgy. So uh, the relation to the clergy and liturgy, the people in the liturgy are co-celebrants. And you know we say that the people must fulfill their royal priesthood. And ultimately, you, you know, even we talked about this in the very beginning, uh, the word liturgy means work of the people. And Abuna can't have, for example, his own liturgy just by himself. There has to be, there has to be other people there. There have to be the, the shab, right? the, 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 the congregation has to be there. Uh, and the reason the congregation has to be there is we are co-celebrants. The congregation are co-celebrants with the clergy. And there's this beautiful uh, mix between them. Right? St. Basil says, um, everything is equal between us, the clergy, and you, the laity. So this is St. Basil in the 5th century. Everything is equal between us, the clergy, and the laity. We have the same measures of goods, for I do not receive more richly and you in a lesser measure from the holy table, but equally we draw from, from it. It so happens that I go first, but this is not so great, since even among children the oldest one extends his hand first to receive the food, but nothing more than this is done since all things are equal among us. We are in like manner the brethren of Christ. All things are common to us. So he's talking about this, this synergy, this, this, this co-celebration between lurgy, uh, the clergy and the laity um, back in the fifth century. Even. Father Alexander Schmemann, in his very famous book, The Eucharist, writes, the church is not a religious society in which God rules through the priests over the people. So God isn't ruling the people through the priests, but the very body of Christ with no other source and content of her life than the divine human life of Christ himself. This means that in the church, no one submits to another as laity to clergy, but all together we submit to each other in the unity of the divine human life. All right, so again, he's trying to formalize as, as the clergy is developing in the early uh, centuries, we see uh, that the, the importance of this, this unity between them is, is key. So, what is communion and, and why is it necessary? So the church in, in the Orthodox concept is the only means of salvation. We think of it like Noah's Ark, right? If, 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 uh, if you were a really good swimmer, it didn't really matter. Uh, everyone who's outside the Ark perishes. And, and this is why we, one of the three designs of the church is a, a structure like an Ark, like a ship. Um, because we view the church as Noah's Ark. Everyone inside is alive and everyone outside perishes. And the church is Christ's body, right? So th this, this church that we're in is, is the body of Christ. And remember the Lord said he's the head and we are members of the body. This becomes very important later on. So we must become a part of this body, right? This body of Christ to attain salvation. We must unite ourselves with him to attain salvation. So we have to become a part of him. He is this church. He is the ship. He is the savior, right? And we have to become a part of him. Therefore, communion is with Christ through the church, which is his body. So these, all these things are, are connected. Right? And so let's kind of talk very quickly about the story of, of what happened, right? So we know that Adam fell, and before Adam fell, he lived in harmony with himself. He lived in harmony with God. He lived in harmony with the creation. Um, we know that he even named the animals and that he wasn't afraid of the animals or, or scared of the animals or they didn't attack him. Right. And if we had to pick a word to describe this beautiful relationship between God and man, between Adam, the first Adam, in the Garden of Eden, and God, you know, what, what word would you pick uh, to describe this relationship? And uh, you guys can stay if you want. Um, and the, the word that you would pick to describe this relationship is communion. You want to tell me something? Okay. You're going to stay? Oh. <laughs> Um, 
So if we had to pick a word to describe Adam's relationship with God before the fall, it would be communion, right? There's a harmony, there's a beauty there, right? So ultimately, communion, my daughter is here, and she's the only one in the church. Um, uh, com and and this, this is ultimately what happens. So Adam falls, right? he sins, and immediately what happens is he's separated from God. And this is really one of the definitions of sin. Right, one of the definitions of sin is separation from God. Anything that separates me from God is sin. Right, could it be a, a cup of coffee? Sure. Right, if a cup of coffee keeps me from taking communion in the morning and I'm addicted to coffee and caffeine and I have to have my coffee, well then coffee now all of a sudden has become a sin in my life that I have to work on and, get, and, and, and work to remove. And so ultimately, after Adam falls, the purpose of our life is to, be, is to return to this state of Adam before the fall. So everything we do in the church we're trying to return to the state of Adam before the fall. Um, I don't know how to turn off the live stream, Nick. Okay. Okay. Um, and so this is really our goal. Even little things in the church like facing the east. Right? One, of the, one of the reasons why we face east in the church is because in the Bible, in the book of Genesis, it says that the paradise of joy was in the east. Right? So even the way we face as a church, we, we yearn for this old state of man. And lots of things in the church, by the way, we do uh, because we want to we want to be like Adam before the fall. Even stuff like fasting, the way we fast, we fast as vegans. Uh, and one of the reasons we fast as vegans is Adam was a vegan. Um, and mankind didn't eat meat until after Noah's Ark. Uh, so even when we picked fasting, we picked a way that returned us to the state of Adam. So how do we return to this state of Adam before the fall? That's kind of the ideal that we want to get back to. The way we do it is through the second Adam, right? And this is what, this is what the Gospels uh, call Christ, right? They call him the second Adam, right? Who brought us back. The first Adam brought us down and the second Adam uh, brought us up, right? So through unity with Christ, we return to this state. So if you want to kind of look at it graphically, God creates man in his image after his likeness. Man commits sin, he's expelled from paradise. And then now God starts to prepare man for the second, for this coming of his son, right? He sends us the prophets and he sends us the law and he sends us Moses and he sends us this life with God that teaches them and gets them ready for, for, for the savior, for the Messiah to come. And then finally Christ takes the form of a man. He takes my flesh. And the goal now becomes this savior wants to take us back up to the Father. He wants to take us back up to the state of Adam before the fall. And how do I do that? Well, I have to unite myself with this Savior, right? And I have to take myself and, and morph myself into him. And the two of us go together. So, so Christ says, look, you know, I'm, accept, I'm an acceptable sacrifice before my Father, right? He, he'll accept me as, in the, as, as and, and I'll adopt you and you become part of my flesh and together we'll go up to the Father. So how do we become a part of this body? Um, as most of you know, we, it starts with baptism. Right? Baptism is how we, we get, uh, as the words of, of the baptismal ceremony, the beautiful words of the baptismal ceremony, we say we are, um, we are grafted into the body of Christ. Right? So uh, this is why uh, Christ used some very strong words in the Gospel of John. He said, most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Right? This is very strong words. St. Paul continues, for by one spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether Jew or Greek, whether slave or free, have all been made to drink into one spirit. Galatians says, for as many of you who were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. So baptism is how we become a part of this body. Right? That's, the, that's, our, that's our initial uh, connection with the body of Christ. Right? And this is why the baptismal font uh, in, the, in the northwest corner of the church is also known as the church's womb, right? It's where, where she gives birth to us. Um, and in fact, in the early church, they used to celebrate the baptismal day and not the birthday. Your actual birthday uh, wasn't celebrated and the, your baptismal day was celebrated. It's a more important day, right? The first one was sort of your initial life. Um, but the, when, the day you become a part of the church, the day you became a part of Christ's body uh, is the day we really used to celebrate. And, and, and Eucharist, as you all know, is only allowed after baptism. We don't, we don't give just anyone the Eucharist. Um, and there's, there's lots of reasons for that, right? Baptism is, um, okay, baptism is rebirth and regeneration. It is, it is being born again. 
And the question is, how can you unite with something that is not of your nature? Right? How can I become a part of something that is not my nature? Right? So what, you know, sometimes someone will come to the Eucharist and say, someone will come to our church who's not baptized and you know, we'll say, you, well, you can't take communion with us. And they'll say, well, well, why not? And we'll say, well, you're not really part of this. Right? And, and if you want to be, become a part of this, absolutely. But uh, the, 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 the Eucharist is nourishment nourishment for someone who's, who's been born, right? Someone who's alive, someone who's part of this, this body. And so, you know, the question is, how can one be nourished before they're born? And, and when you think about even the story of Exodus, we read that um, the, the, the passing through the Red Sea, right? When, when Pharaoh was destroyed and the people of Israel came out, Pharaoh is a symbol of Satan and the passing of the Red Sea is a symbol of baptism, right? Where Satan is destroyed and they start their life with God, right? And if you look at the people of Israel, they didn't really start their life with God until after they passed through the Red Sea. Then they went into the wilderness, right? And manna, which we'll learn about a little bit later, is one of the symbols of, of the Eucharist. And the manna only came after the baptism. And so, uh, finally, we can think of it as partaking of my, of my master's inheritance, right? So, I can only partake of the, of the inheritance when I'm a son. And you know, say, you know, I have a... I'm a, I'm a person and, and I have, I've got a lot of money and then I pass away and I write my will and I say, I want to leave all my money to my dog. Well, I mean, okay, now you probably do anything you want, but you, you can't really leave your money to a dog, right? You can't really have, let your dog inherit because the dog, even though he, you know, you can say, well, the dog was lo more loyal than my kids were and he's a good dog and he's a better dog. It doesn't matter. He's just not, he's not part of me. He's not, he's not my son, right? And so I can't just give something that's an, uh, my inheritance to something that's not uh, part of my nature. And I love this quote from St. Cyril of Alexandria, and I think this is one of the most beautiful ways I can think about it. He says, as just as by melting two candles together, you get one piece of wax. So I think one who receives the flesh and bloody, body, blood of Jesus is fused together with him by this communion. And the soul finds that he is in Christ and Christ is in him. I love this, right? So he, he thinks of it as taking wax. You know, when you melt wax into liquid, and then you pour it into each other, and then you let it cool, and then it just becomes one new candle. Right? And this is, this is what the Eucharist is, where, and the beauty of it is if you think about the way, the way uh, Christ uh, instituted the Last Supper, food is this one thing that can penetrate into us. And, and it per permeates every cell in our body, right? As, as our body decomposes the food, it, it'll literally go into every cell of, of the body, right? And, and so we meld with Christ and we become a part of him. So how do we remain in this body once we become a part, once we're born into the body, how do we then do we remain in the body? First one is theologically, right? We, have, we say one faith, one baptism, one body. And this is why heretics when we want to do something to a heretic, what's the worst thing we can do to someone in the church? I mean, the absolute worst thing you can do is excommunicate them. And what does that mean, excommunicate them? It just simply means they can't take communion. That's it. That's the whole thing. That's the worst thing we've got to do to anyone. Because what we're doing is we're cutting them off from the life of the church, the life of Christ. We're saying no communion. This is a big deal. And so when we, we remain in the body, we have to remain in the body Theologically, we have to be a part of this this same flesh. You know, going back to this example, you know, when, when someone walks into the church, say they're whatever a different faith, a Mormon, Jehovah's Witness, a Hindu, and they say, you know, I really want to take communion, and we say, you know, well, no, you, I'm sorry, you can't. You have to be Orthodox. And they say, well, that's you know, that's persecution, that's racist, that's judgmental, that's sorry, that's whatever. You know, the the question I always have for for someone like that is, well, why would you want to take communion? Why would you want to take part of this church when you, you know, of this Christ when you don't believe in the same Christ we believe in? I mean, I imagine if I went to um, uh, a Mormon uh, gathering and they were having communion, which they, they don't do the way, obviously the same way we do, and they say, here, come take communion with me. I'd say, well, you know what? I don't really feel comfortable taking communion because you and I, we don't believe the same thing. Or we're not part of the same flesh theologically. Right? So... The, just like the human body, when, when, when something foreign enters the human body, the human body rejects it. Right? And this is ultimately the way the body of Christ is. Right? It, it has to be, it doesn't, you know, if you try to put a kidney in somebody and it's the wrong blood type or the wrong body type, the body will reject it. 
In fact, the body will attack it. They'll think it's something foreign, right? And this is, this is the job of, of there's certain cells, you know, the, the killer T cells and the white blood cells. And these is parts of the body that their, their job is to attack anything foreign that's in the body. Right? So the body has to be unified and has to be pure. And this is why, you know, in the beginning of the liturgy of the, of the, of the faithful, right? The very beginning of the, the liturgy, the first thing we do is what? What do we say? right as the liturgy of the faithful begins, you know, the last part of the liturgy where we take communion, it starts with the creed. We believe in one God, God the Father, the Pantocrat. Why? Why does the church do that? Because it, there's no separation between the spiritual life and the theological life, right? If we're all going to be one body, right, as we start, let's, let's get together and let's just say, you know, this is what we believe as, as one body before, before we become uh, one flesh. This is the be a beautiful verse from John 15, and I love this icon. He says, I am the true vine. Remain in me, and I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. This is really powerful stuff, right? Because oftentimes, I try to bear fruit by myself. Oftentimes, I try to do things. Worse, when I actually do do things, I think I did it. I, I give myself the credit, right? I think, look at, look at what I was able to do. Right? But Christ is very clear, you can't bear fruit by yourself. You're a branch in me. Everything that comes out of the branch, every fruit, every leaf, we don't look at that fruit or that leaf and say, wow, what a great branch. Right? We say, what a great tree. You know, you have a, a nice avocado tree and it puts out these really great avocados. It doesn't matter where the avocados are coming from. You don't, you, no one's saying, you know, branch 17 is a good band, branch and branch 24 is a great branch. It's coming from this tree, right? And the tree is giving it life. He says, neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Very strong. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Right? This is what communion is. This is how we, we, we take the life of the trunk of the tree, right? The, you know, the roots of the tree, they go down, they get the water, they get the nutrients out of the soil, and then they pump it back up through the tree, right? And that life is communion, right? In fact, um, you know, in the, in, the, in the book of Genesis, we read that there were two trees, right? One was the tree of uh, knowledge of good and evil that Adam and Eve ate from. And what was the other tree? The tree of life, right? And after they ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, the sinful the, the sin, Christ or God sent a cherub to block the tree of life. He said, don't take communion in this state. Right? The tree of life, we've always, the church has always known that the tree of life is the Eucharist, is communion. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. Right? I mean, we all know this, right? You cut a branch off a tree, you leave it on the ground for a few days, what happens? It dies. It can't live away from the tree. Yet, yet sometimes we'll, we'll exclude ourselves from communion, we'll remove ourselves from communion, we'll remove ourselves from the life-giving mysteries of the church, and we'll say, I wonder why there's no life in me. And it's obvious. We've, we've cut ourselves off from the source. The next way we remain in the body is spiritually. And this is a very important concept, and I'll end with this one. Um, we have to care about each other because we're one body. And the fact that we're one body is a very, very powerful image, right? There, there is no way that the body can turn on itself, right? There's no way, you know, my hand will start punching my own face, right? In fact, it's, it's often the opposite, right? If, if something, if someone is punching me in the face, right, my hand will actually go and block my face so that the blows go to the hand and not to the, the face, Right? So the body will protect itself, and the body will heal itself, and the body will restore itself. So this image is very important, because if we really get that we're a body, then the way we treat one another has to be different. Right? It can't be that you are against me, or I don't like that guy, or I don't like her, or she's trying to get me. You know, we're not just friends in the church. We're not just a community of cops who have the similar faith, or similar heritage, or similar background, or... No, we're much more than that. We're united not just as friends, as buddies, as people we get along with. We're united in a, in a mystical, Eucharistic, mysterious way. We're actually a part of each other, right? And once we get that, that we're a part of each other, then our interactions have to be different with each other, once we fully understand that. Um, 
And this is why, by the way, confession used to be public in the early church, right? And when I sinned, I sinned against three people. I sinned against God, I sinned against myself, and I sinned against all of you, right? Because you're all part of me, right? There's no way part of the body can mess up and not affect another part of the body, right? So um, that's why confession used to be public. People would say, well, if, if you sinned, well, then you need to tell everybody you sinned and confess to the rest of the body. And, and this is the beauty of why when, when Christ instituted the Eucharist, he, he used bread and wine. Because if you think about bread and wine, um, the, the, the bread is composed of many grains, right? It, it, you take all this wheat and you grind it down into flour so that the flour is indistinguishable from each other. And then you make bread. Wine is the same thing. You take a bunch of grapes and you smash them. And when you smash them, they become uh, uh, wine, right? And, and through the process. So both of those things, when you look at them, they're just, it's just wine, but it's not just wine, right? It's made up of, of many, many grapes, thousands of grapes. It's just like the bread. It looks like a piece of bread, but it's made up of thousands of grains of, of wheat. And this is what St. Paul says in Corinthians, for we, though many, are one bread and one body, for we all partake of that one bread. Father Alexander Schmim, and I'll continue, he says, and this is very important, he says, even while standing in the church, we continue to sense some people as neighbors and other as strangers. So even when you're in church, there's people I know and people I don't know. A faceless mass that has no relevance to us, the strangers, and, our, and to our prayers, and disturbs our spiritual concentration. He uses the word, it, he, these other people, they disturb me. Right? So imagine this is a scene we see, right? We're at church, there's someone loud, there's some kids, there's some old whatever, and you're like, they disturb me. How often do seemingly spiritually attuned and devout people openly declare their distaste for crowded gatherings, which disturbs them from praying and seek empty and quiet chapels, secluded corners, separate from the crowds. Right? I love this quote. So he's saying, Often spiritually devout people will say, you know, I don't like crowded churches. I like to go where there's no other people. I don't want to be around anybody. I want to be alone to pray. In fact, such individual, and he uses the word self-absorption, right? You're self-absorbed. Would hardly be possible in the church assembly and of our participation in it. I mean, the whole point of the church is to be together. Concerning this individual prayer, the gospel says, when you go, go into your room and shut the door and pray. So there is a time for individual prayer. And Christ says, you go, shut the door and pray. And your father who sees you in secret will reward you openly. Does this not mean that the assembling of the church has another purpose? Already contained in the very word assembly? I mean, what's the point of all of us driving from all the different places around Orange County or around the world or wherever we are to this one spot and then pray together? Why don't we all just pray at home? Right? Why don't we all just go into our room, shut the door as Christ said and pray? There's a reason we all get in our car and we drive all the way here and we come all at the same time and we stand in the same place and we say the same thing in the same way. Right? That's what the whole assembly of the believers means. Right? We, now we assemble. Now we become a body again. And so to do that, to get in a car and to drive all the way here and to assemble with everyone, to be a part of the body again and say, yeah, you know, I don't want to be around people. It just makes no sense. That's why you came. Through it, the church fulfills herself. This is what makes her a church. Accomplishes our communion with Christ and with his love so that in participate, participating in it, we comprise out of many, one body, the, the quote I just read you from St. Paul to the Corinthians. Out of many, one body, right? And that's what the whole assembly of the Eucharist is. That's why we get in our cars and drive out here. St. John Chrysostom says, just as the bread is constituted by many grains united together so that the grains cannot be distinguished from one another, even though they are there, since their difference is made unapparent in their cohesion, in the same manner, we are joined together both to each other and to Christ. So he's saying you can't distinguish the grains, something I talked about earlier. But this is important. In the same manner, we are joined both to each other and to Christ. So when I become 
when I come take the Eucharist, I don't just become a part of Christ. I become a part of you. You become a part of me. We become a part of each other. Right? And not just the people in this parish, but all of the Orthodox Christians. We become a part of each other. And I want to take it a step further. Not just the Orthodox Christians or the Christians who are alive today who are taking communion, but all the Orthodox Christians who have taken communion. So I now become a part of Christ and I become a part of Abuna and I become a part of the people in the congregation and I become a part of St. Mary and a part of St. Anthony and he becomes a part of me and we all mold and, and meld into this body of Christ that has existed from before the ages, as we say, from generation to generation. And that's why we list all of those people in the commemoration. And then we list the people who recently passed away. And then we say, as for us who are sojourners in this world, keep us in your faith unto the end. So we have the, the, apostle, the, 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 the saints in the commemoration, the people who just passed away, and us who are going to pass away. And we say from generation to generation. So it is and so it shall be. Right? We all become a part of each other. For you are not part of one body and your neighbor part of another, but all are part of the same body. For this reason, St. Paul emphasizes all, us partake, all of us partake of one bread. And this is why in the Orthodox Church we insist that we start with one bread and we break it. And then we all take a piece of that one bread. You know, and once a monk explained this to me beautifully. He said, you know, I was trying, having trouble understanding how we all become part of one body. And he said, if you take the Urbana and when Abuna prays on it, how many bodies of Christ do we have? And I said, one. And he said, okay. Now Abuna takes this body and he breaks it into a hundred pieces. How many bodies of Christ do we have? And I said, one. He goes, now he takes a hundred pieces and he puts them in the mouth of everyone in the church. How many bodies of Christ do we have? I said, one. He said, yeah, but now huh, we're all in this body together. This, we've all become a part of, of this body. So, continuing with the, 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 the concept of the vine of life, the tree of life, and we're almost done. Um, one thing about a tree is that the branches tend to grow apart over time, right? And they, 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 can, they can actually grow distant, and they can be very different, right? Uh, in fact, you may even think that two fruits are from different trees, right? You can look at a, you know, a big tree, avocado tree, for example, and you can find one avocado here, and you can find another avocado 40 feet away, right? And one avocado is, you know, what, 60 feet up, and another avocado is only 20 feet up. So one's really high, one's really low, one's over here, one's over there, and you think, wow, there's no way these two avocados came from the same tree, right? Because they look so far apart. They look so different in their, just from the outside, ge geographically, by location, they're, they're so different. Different height, different size, different angles, right? So the branches that come from the tra same tree may p appear to come from different places and look very different, right? But they're all rooted in Christ. So sometimes we, as, as, as the church, we all look different, right? Some saints are martyrs, some saints are prayers, some saints give to the poor, help the poor, some people are solitary, some people serve. Everyone has a role. Everyone has a very different role, right? And sometimes we think there's no way that person, that person belong in the same Christ, but they absolutely do. And they just look very, very differently. So sometimes we'll condemn someone else's role. Oh, you know what the church really needs is more theologians. Ah, we do, need, we do need theologians, right? But we also need chanters and we also need servants and we also need people who visit the sick and we also need people who cook meals for pregnant women and we also need people to help with the children. We also need people who clean the church and we also need, we need a million different types of people. We need as many types of people in the church as we have cells in the body. How many different types of cell are there? It's like saying, you know, the heart's really important. We should all be heart cells. That's just silly, right? And, and there, we all shall, shall all be brain cells. And then the brain says, well, I think I'm more important than the heart. That's just a silly discussion, right? Without any, any of them, you'd just be dead. So, yeah, we all may look very different and we all may look like we're in different places, but we're all coming from the exact same tree, the body of Christ. Um, I'll skip that. So, uh, the, 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 um, um, one of my, my final points is, is again, what, what, what is, what is it about communion and what is it about sacrifice? The sacrifice of Christ on the cross. How does it, how does it save our sins? I, I guess I will go back. St. Athanasius says, Christ carried all of mankind's sins on the cross and died 
on behalf of, 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 of man. And so he took all of our sins, and this is what we do in confession, by the way. We take our sins, and we confess them, right? And we, we throw them onto Christ, right? And, and we know that the wage of sin is death, right? So when we confess our sins and we put them on Christ, what we're, what we're saying and what we're doing, in essence, is saying, now you die for them, right? I'm, I don't want to die for my sins, so you're going to die. You die in, in, on my behalf, right? So this perfect sacrifice doesn't need re repeating. This was the sacrifice of the cross. It was once and it was perfect, right? So, but how do we partake in this sacrifice? How do we share in this sacrifice, right? Obviously, when Christ came and he died on the sins and he forgave all of our sins, right? We don't ever have to repeat that sacrifice, but I want to be a part of that, right? I want to be a part of that crucified Christ. I want to be a part of that resurrected Christ, right? And this is what communion is. It brings me into him, the one who died and the one who resurrected. Um, Pope Shunda had this nice analogy. He said, you know, it's like when your mom cooks a meal and she puts the pot on the stove and she puts a big, you know, spoon in the pot and says, all right, whoever wants to eat, eat. She doesn't put the food in your mouth, but she offers it. And she does it once and for all and she makes the food and she says, okay, now you have to serve yourself and partake uh, and be a part of this, of, this, uh, of this meal. So when we think about sacrifice and sacrifice, you know, the question is, did Christ offer the five loaves and the two fish to the people? Or did the people offer the five loaves and the two fish to Christ? Who offered to whom? And obviously the answer is both, right? They offered and then Christ offered. He took what they offered and he gave it back to them. So in the Eucharist, do we partake of Christ's sacrifice or do we come to ourselves and sacrifice for Christ? Both. We partake of Christ's sacrifice and we offer our sacrifice. And, and where do we see this perfectly get fulfilled? With the martyrs. Did Christ die for the martyrs or did the martyrs die for Christ? Both. Right. There's this beautiful story about Abu Nimshoi Kama. He was praying at the, 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 the convent of St. Uh, Demiana. And there, if you've ever been there, the, the altar is on the, the tombs of the, of the 40 virgins in St. Demiana. And you, you actually pray on it. And he was, he was meditating. He says, who died for who? Did Christ die for St. Demiana? Or did St. Demiana die for Christ? And the answer is both. Right? There's mutual love and this mutual sacrifice. So Christ says... Uh, St. Paul says in Timothy about Christ, for there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus. And sometimes people hear this verse, there is one mediator between God and mankind, and say, you see, why do you have intercession? Why do you have saints? Why do you pray and ask the saints to intercede on our behalf when St. Paul very clearly says there is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus? So what about these saints? Right? So when Christ stands before the Father and he is the one mediator be between God and man, where are all the saints? Aren't they a part of his body? So when Christ is standing there, aren't they a part of him? Aren't they all members in his flesh? Right? So we intercede for those who passed away and they intercede for those on earth. Right? In, the, in the prayers, we often pray for those who have passed away. Right? And people will remember their grandma and their grandpa and their uncle and, and their mom and their dad. And they'll remember them in their prayers. And they'll ask God for mercy for them. And guess what those people are doing? The same thing. Right? They're praying for their sons and daughters and their grandchildren. And they're offering prayers for them as well. Right? So when, when, I, when I ask St. Anthony to pray for me or St. Mary to pray for me, where is he? Where is St. Anthony? He's in Christ. Right? So as Christ stands and becomes this acceptable sacrifice before God, the saints are in him. Right? They're a part of him. Right? So uh, th this, is, this is what we mean by partakers of divine nature. We become a partaker of this divine nature, right? what St. Peter said. So communion is the actual real act of connection. It's not a meditation or a spiritual thought or a, or a nice idea. You know, it's like, oh, that, that's a great idea. You know, we're all... No, it's, it's, it's more than that. It's mystical. It's Eucharistic. It's a mystery of the church. Right? We become a part of Christ in a real way. 
right? I unite with him on a total level, right? And this is why St. Paul talks about it like marriage. The Christ, he says, Christ and the church. It's like marriage. The two become very united, the man and the woman, in the same way. A total unification. I become flesh of, of his flesh, and he becomes flesh of my flesh. Right? And if you think about what communion is, I love the way St. Cyril said it again, this idea of wax melting together. And, and, and when I think of God wanting to offer me his love, you know, when, when you hug someone, and you know, you know when you, you take a kid before Corona, and you would hug them, and you'd squeeze them really tight, and you'd give them just like this really big hug, right? And you don't want to let go of the kid, and you love the kid so much, right? Sometimes it's almost as if you're, you're hugging them, and it's almost as if the bodies are getting in the way. It's like I, you're, you're hugging a friend, and you just want to get closer and closer and closer to them and the body is, is, is getting in the way. And so Christ, with the act of the Eucharist, figured out a way to bypass that problem. Right? When he put his arms out on the cross, St. Athanasius says, it's like he welcomed the entire world. Right? He died with his arms open in love. And it's as if he wants to give you this hug. Right? And the body gets in the way, so he figured out a way to get inside the body. Right? He figured out a way to bypass that and so now he comes in and he touches us inside us. So in conclusion, this is the part of the liturgy that we say every week. Make us, O Lord, worthy to, say, to, part, worthy to partake of the holy mysteries for the sanctif sanctification of our souls, bodies, and spirits. And here's the important part. And have a portion and an inheritance together with the saints who have pleased you since the beginning. Right? And bring us all together into one flesh whether it just be those on earth, those who have passed, those who are to come, all of us become united in the one, one flesh of Christ. Thank you very much, and glory be to God forever. Amen. God bless you all, and hopefully we'll uh, see you soon one of these days.